Bienvenue. Welcome to the webinar, Who Counts as a Person? Disability, Mental Health and the Violence of Concealment. My name is Monica Ruiz Casares. I'm an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at McGill University and Coordinator of the Global Mental Health Research Seminar in the Faculty of Medicine. I will be moderating this webinar. This webinar is part of a series that we launched last year with support from the McGill Global Mental Health Program, the Quebec Population Health Research Network, and the Sherpa Research Institute. We're delighted to expand the training that is offered in our uh, summer program in social and cultural psychiatry, which this year celebrates its 25th anniversary. By means of these webinars, we hope to contribute to raising awareness on mental health disparities around the world, exchanging social, cultural, and critical research in global mental health, and building bridges across languages, across geographical lo locations, disciplines, sectors. So wherever you're joining us from, we're thrilled to share this space with you. Before I introduce our speaker, let me point out a couple of important features of this platform that will facilitate your participation in the webinar. If you're joining us directly from the computer or the voice boxer mobile app, notice that you can select the language of your choice, English, French, or Spanish, at the bottom of the screen. Also, your microphones are all muted, but you will be able to send questions for the speaker at any time in any language using the general chat box underneath my image on the screen. You cannot see the presenter or chat if you're connecting through a cell phone though. For any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact the voice boxer support team by clicking on the question mark icon on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. They're always there to help. Let's now introduce our speaker. Dr. Leslie Swartz is a clinical psychologist and a distinguished professor of psychology at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. He's an associate editor of the journal Transcultural Psychiatry and has a long-standing interest in cultural issues in mental health, particularly issues of care in low-income settings and uh, as well as disability studies. In fact, the webinar today is the result of this long-standing uh, commitment to issues of social inclusion and participation for people with disabilities in Southern Africa. We're privileged to have him with us today Thank you, Leslie, for accepting our invitation. I will now pass the floor to you so you can start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Monica, and thank you to everybody at McGill and all the support people behind the scenes for giving me this opportunity, particularly to you and Sakiko, who I have to tell everyone, they have to be the most patient people on earth to be dealing with me. So it's a, it's a real honor for me to be giving this webinar. Perhaps uh, I'm a little, being going to be a little bit selfish as it provides me with an opportunity to reflect on aspects of my own career and on issues which are really concerning me at the moment. Um, I just want to say one thing before I start in terms of the language that I use. I'm aware that some of the people who are joining the webinar um, are probably in North America. Within uh, the disability movement, there's a lot of debate about how to refer to people and um, in North America and in the United Nations Convention, the people first language tends to be used, which is people with disabilities. Uh, I'm quite influenced by the British social model, which argues that uh, people have impairments but are disabled by society. So when I use the term disabled people, I'm using it advisedly and not because I'm, I'm unaware that there are other conventions. Uh, so. Um, okay, I'm just seeing that the, the slides all work. I'm, I'm starting with uh, a little bit of my own kind of personal history. My own work in the field of transcultural psychiatry began with my training as a clinical psychologist in Cape Town, where I'm sitting now, in the early 1980s, and was my first job as a researcher in a psychiatry research unit. It was absolutely impossible at that time in South Africa not to be affected profoundly by racial politics, regardless of the position you took in response to these politics. And in the late 1970s, the American Psychiatric Association visited South Africa and delivered a really devastating report, report on apartheid psychiatry. I haven't got the time to go into the details of that report here, but I just want to tell one 
kind of story. The APA noted that in segregated psychiatric hospitals, and they were all segregated racially at that time, the nutritional quality of the food given to black patients was inferior to that given to white patients. In response to this, organized psychiatry in South Africa said that the reason black and white patients were given different foods is that black people culturally preferred certain kinds of foods. They wouldn't want to eat the nutritionally superior food given to white people. Now, in my view, this was complete nonsense, uh, but a key example of how the concept of being culturally sensitive was being used to mask discriminatory pro uh, practices. In 1985, I published what for me was a foundational paper for the rest of my career. It was called Issues for Cross-Cultural Psychiatric Research in South Africa. And I made a very simple point. Globally, and especially after Arthur Kleinman published his game-changing and still wonderful, I, I just reread it for this uh, seminar, Depression, Somatization, and the New Cross-Cultural Psychiatry in 1977, the view on the part of progressive mental health professionals was that we must give due account to cultural differences in the experience, understanding, and treatment of mental disorders. Now, I doubt whether many people attending this webinar would disagree with this today. All I showed at the time, though, was that the idea of respect for cultural difference could be perverted and was being perverted in the service of racial discrimination and denying access to services in South Africa. One of the reviewers of the, the paper at that time commented that the paper might have implications beyond the immediate South African context. And I hope I'm going to show in this webinar how helpful and how prescient that reviewer comment was. In the event, much of my own academic writing in the 1980s and early 1990s, which was during the time of the crucible of the violent death throes of the apartheid regime, focused on the interface between mental health practice and politics. Many of the papers I wrote on my own or with colleagues envisaged a kind of mythical, utopian post-apartheid future. With the advent of a non-racial, with the, the advent of a non-racial, non-sexist democracy, with far less spending on the apartheid securocratic state, we argued, mental health services would improve dramatically and we would move to a situation of far better and far more accessible mental health care for everybody in South Africa. Now, I don't want to detract from real strides which have been made in improving mental health care in South Africa, but I want to anchor this talk to recent events in a democratic South Africa which quite appropriately have shaken our country and, and our idea of our country to its roots. This is, what, this is what has come to be known as the S.E.D. Mani tragedy. Now the word S.E.D. Mani um, literally means place of dignity. And uh, the slide that I'm showing you now shows 94 of the people who died as a result of this tragedy. Um, I haven't got time to go into detail about the tragedy, but effectively what, what happened was that the, uh, in the, the wealthiest province in our country, which is Gauteng province, um, wanted to save money. And the idea was to, to move people, largely people with intellectual disability from um, relatively expensive care in institutions run by this organization called Life SED Many into cheaper places in the community. And uh, I have a timeline up there which was prepared by one of our news organizations. In June 2015, to its great credit, the South African Psychiatry of Psychiatrists warned that if these people were moved, would be moved from life is city many into these unregistered community facilities, tragedies may happen. Ignoring that, the Minister of Health in that province in Gauteng, Gaidani Mahlangu, announced the termination of the contract with life is city many and the start of what came to be called the is city many decanting. And by June 2016, all patients were moved out of life is city many. Families didn't know where their patients were and they started searching. By August of 2016, Christina Tumalo discovered that her sister was dead and she discovered uh, the, about the deaths 
of eight other patients. And it just began to, to uh, es escalate. By September, we knew that 36 patients were dead. Um, then uh, the health minister uh, asked for an inquiry. There, there was an ombudsman report. Um, and eventually a report was released. As far as we know, 144 people died uh, as a result of this decanter. These were vulnerable people who were placed in the community, um, and not properly supervised under the most uh, terrible and, and difficult conditions. So this is really, this is not a, a tragedy during apartheid. This is a, a, a tragedy which has occurred 25 years into our democracy in the country of Nelson Mandela. So I'm using this really to, to ask the question, how, how could this happen with one of the most progressive constitutions in the world? Um, what went wrong and how did it go wrong? And what does this mean for understanding culture and psychiatry? In order to do that, I'm gonna go um, back uh, to my own training and experience. I got interested in disability studies as a field about 15 years ago. I was completely unprepared for working in the field, despite having trained as a clinical psychologist. Nothing in my training had helped me think about the complexity of the politics of social exclusion and stigmatization, the ubiquity of disavowal, the ways in which bodies are made to signify what those in, who live in them do not want to signify. My introduction to the field of intellectual disability in 1980 was in my very early in the first year of my training, my professional training in clinical psychology. And I can still recall the terror of that week. My fellow trainees and I were put to work as nurse aides in what went on as the back wards of an old style Victorian building institution, catering for people with intellectual disability. In that week, I saw people hidden from society and permanently institutionalized. I saw the robust stoicism and lack of engagement of the few very poorly qualified people caring for patients behind locked doors. After this week of confusion and misery, I hardly heard about intellectual disability again in my training as a clinical psychologist. Like a conscript or a military volunteer, I had, I had weathered the privations of basic training. I'd gone through the process of manning up to my new profession and I could put the experience and more crucially for this discussion, the lives of institutionalized people with intellectual disability behind me and move on to the real interesting and pleasant work of becoming and being a clinical psychologist. It would be very unfair of me not to acknowledge that the very talented clinical psychologist and trainer who put us through this rite of passage had noble motives. He was a very, very interested in the distressing problem of self-injurious behavior amongst people with autism and intellectual disability and was working uh, in the then popular, though now largely discredited, low vast tradition. He'd shown some good results, in fact, in helping institutionalized people to hurt themselves less. He wanted some of us to work in this area, but I also suspect that he himself was probably traumatized by his own work in this institution. And I think that part of his motivation for throwing new recruits to professional training into a week of working as nurse aides in back wards was to communicate the extent of his own trauma and to make us experience this trauma too. In discussing work with children who have been severely burned in Cape Town, and I'm not sure whether people know that uh, the epidemiology of burns is such that uh, infants rarely suffer burns in richer countries, but quite commonly do in poorer countries, low and middle income countries. Louise Frankel speaks of an impulse that practitioners, and she includes herself in this, have to traumatize others as a way of trying to um, process their own trauma by putting it into others. And I think something similar was going on here. But what fascinates me here when I think about this experience, which it's now almost 40 years ago, is how the people with intellectual disability themselves and the women in charge of them in these back wards, they, these people were reduced to ciphers, not in a story about them, but in a story about us. A story about how privileged, highly educated people 
you'd secured places in a prestigious professional training, were, were not able to be tough enough to bear privations and earn the badge of true professionals. These people were the obstacle course, the pack drill. What was less clear to me then, or if it was clear, I was very good at making it unclear uh, to myself in a defensive way, was that these incarcerated people were in fact people. They were living their lives in a situation of confinement and privation. The nurse aides for their part were poorly qualified, badly paid, working long shifts in a total institution, uh, playing a key social role in keeping people, we as a society as a whole, would rather not see at all, and certainly not see as people, out of sight of most of us. The nurse aides were also people who had far fewer choices than I had, even at that very young age, about how they were going to spend their working and personal lives. As the character in the play by South Africa's most famous playwright, Ethel Pugard, whose picture is up on the right of your screen, uh, said uh, angrily about her own life in, in, the, in the play of the same name, people are living there. I must take personal responsibility, responsibility for forgetting or for, for not allowing myself to remember that people were living there that the inmates of the back wards and those in charge of them were people living their lives. Now, I feel shame about this personally, but it's also important to recognize that my forgetting, my not seeing, was politically structured. It was enabled by the society in which I live and by the profession into which at that time I was being socialized and to which I now spend a considerable part of my time socializing others. Another thing that I didn't see at that time was that I was learning and being taught about intellectual disability in a very particular context. Now, I'm not against institutions. In her rather wonderful memoir about being incarcerated with mental disorder in the United Kingdom, the historian Barbara Taylor makes a strong in, uh, argument that institutionalization, especially under conditions of austerity, uh, uh, may be better for people than some forms of deinstitutionalization. Uh, rather than the emancipatory good that it is sometimes universally claimed to be. And we've seen this with the SED many tragedy. People were certainly safer. They weren't dying while they were in institutions. Disability studies as a discipline insists on something psychologists acknowledge, but we're rather good at overlooking the fact that all behavior occurs in context. Within the social model of disability and what has come since, there's a distinction commonly made between impairment, which is purely bodily, a bodily condition, and disability, which refers to the way in which a person with impairment encounters barriers, physical, social, and psychological in the world. Now I need to acknowledge that there's some difficulties with the impairment disability distinction in general, and particularly in relation to intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. But the, ger the general point is important. Environments disable us. A person becomes less able to do things and to participate in society uh, depending on uh, the environment. People may not be able to participate in a disabling environment, but may flourish in an enabling one. Now let's think a little bit about the context in which I and my fellow students and many trainees in our disciplines learn about intellectual disability. The context was a total institution of the type described by Goffman in his classic text, Asylums. Among Goffman's key arguments about total institutions is that they instantiate behavior on the part of everybody who participates in them, regardless of role. And this behavior is determined partly by the total environment. We all know that we behave differently in different contexts. The danger of learning about intellectual disability only on the backward of an institution is that what we saw there was not just intellectual disability, but the behavior of people with intellectual disability who were effectively incarcerated. The incarceration might have been the best or the only option for all or some of the people there. The care may have been well-intentioned. I don't want to get into the detail of whether the care was the best uh, available, but the point I want to make was that I was learning about intellectual disability by a very particular experience. People who are incarcerated, we know this, 
behave differently from how they behave out of jail. But when we deal with intellectual disability and some other disabilities, uh, rather, as a, uh, rather than as a feature of the context, we, we might actually misinterpret effects of incarceration as symptoms of intellectual disability. In this regard, I'm reminded by important work being done by a colleague of mine at Stellenbosch University. She's a, an, a historian of animals and she's currently working on the history of baboons. Um, and she reports in, in her current project on the influential role played by Solly Zuckerman, who is an ex-South African, in shaping the history that we have of baboons. In 1932, Swart tells us, Zuckerman published a book entitled The Social Life of Monkeys and Apes. The book was based very largely on observing baboons in captivity, actually largely in Britain. And his generalizations about baboon behavior come largely from that context. It's been tremendously influential. It's quite instructive what he saw when he studied these baboons. And I quote here from Swart's work. She says, an atmosphere of brutal, top-down repression, suspicion, bullying, and violence pervaded the colony where the baboons were incarcerated under cramped conditions. Might was right. Brutal inequality was natural. In human terms, it was like a scene from our very worst prisons, unquote. Commenting on this, Swart notes, it was just one small hitch. The science was wrong, horribly wrong, dead wrong. With great force, she notes further, and I quote her again, the carceral is never the normal, unquote. From a disability studies perspective, we may quibble with Swart about her use of the term normal, which is always problematic in the context of the politics of what Leonard Davis and others term normalcy. But the fundamental point here is clear. What we learn about incarcerated people and animals is a lesson not solely and perhaps not even primarily a lesson about those people and animals. On the contrary, it is an important lesson about what incarceration is and what it does. A lesson about the social and cultural arrangements which lead those with more power to restrict the freedom of those people and animals with less power. I want to make it clear again, I'm not arguing against all forms of institutionalization. But I'm saying that in thinking about disability, we are thinking not only about people who have impairments of various kinds, but we're also thinking about the social arrangements which historically have placed and continue to place people in particular contexts. We're thinking also then about how people react and deal with various forms of confinement. So confinement uh, creates uh, and is instantiated by certain forms of behavior which may or may not have elements of violence in them. It's the nature of the beast and in some ways it's very easy to see. But there are many other ways to disavow people, their personhood and their needs. Like many psychologists, psychology students of my generation, I could and I did argue forcefully for the closing down of institutions, for the opening of prisons, which had a particular political meaning in South Africa where our leaders were still in jail, for, um, and for the freeing of people labeled mad or crazy. But as the troubled history of deinstitutionalization in psychiatry has shown in many contexts, deinstitutionalization without considerable community support and help may be anything but a solution for particularly vulnerable people. It's very easy to see what the problems are with locking up people and depriving them of their freedom. But it's much less easy to discern what happens to people and how we disavow and abuse them by effectively abandoning them. The psychotherapist Graham Music talks about how psychotherapists and psychotherapeutic theory tends to neglect the issue of neglect and its consequences when we look at childcare. I think he has a useful and very challenging concept of neglecting neglect, and I think it has broader implications. In my limited understanding of his work, he shows how psychotherapists and others are much more skilled in talking about the ways people abuse people, ab abuse children, about the things people do to hurt the more vulnerable than we are at understanding and dealing with an absence of care. If we take this idea more broadly into the politics of care provision for disabled people, 
who need more care than others do, and we all need care at different times of our lives, but some need more than others do, we can start to think not just about the politics of incarceration and confinement, but also about the politics of abandonment and of a more diffuse concealment than the concealment an asylum war obviously provides. In thinking about this issue, I think it's worth noting that the SED mini tragedy is unfortunately not unique in its betrayal and neglect of disabled people. My colleagues Charlotte Capri and others in their very important article, SED Manis are going on all the time, uh, which you'll, you'll find on the website uh, later, argue patients are not dead because they were mentally ill or medically mismanaged. They died because, they, because we were careless. Now they use the word careless here in at least two ways, in the sense of not paying attention, as in he's a careless driver, and in the sense of, of being not concerned or not worried about the health or safety uh, of, of others. They suggest that the lack of care and attention which led to the deaths which we so rightly mourn is an ongoing feature of lives of people with intellectual disability and of some other disabled people more generally. Death makes neglect visible. The fact that there are people with living with neglect should concern us just as much. But beyond the field of disability, there's another South African story which links to this one. 10 years ago, Chigwadere and his photograph is on the right, bottom right of your screen, and his colleagues in 2008 published a very widely cited paper it seems to have faded somewhat from memory. But this team estimated using mathematical modeling that over 330,000 people in South Africa died because of lack of access to antiretroviral med uh, medication under the regime of then President Thabo Mbeki and his Minister of Health, Dr. Mantu Chabalala in Simang, who was photographed at the bottom of the screen there. Now, to use the argument that Capri and others have used in relation to SED Medi, we can say, paraphrasing their words, people with AIDS are not dead because they were ill or didn't have access to antiretroviral, antiretroviral medication. They died because we were careless. And again, I use the word careless in both senses. But I think there's something much more fundamental at stake here. And, and particularly important for transcultural psychiatry and global mental health. I don't have time here to get into my reasons for viewing our then President Becky as a tragic hero of Shakespearean proportions, a man of true greatness but with fatal flaws. But what is clear from the callousness of his health minister, a callousness which he had definitely enabled, is the abuse of a principle which is very important for disability rights and for human rights in general. Chabalala and Simang and Mbeki in a slightly different way gave a two-pronged argument about denying people access to antiretroviral medication. First, there was an appeal to something which I feel as an African is very important to mention. It's an indisputable truth. That we have to affirm this truth in our context. Globally, there has been, and Mbeki and Chabalala and Simang were right about this, a disavowal of African competence and ability. African knowledge systems have been and continue to be disavowed and misrepresented in favor of over-reliance on knowledge from the global north. Secondly, and this point relates strongly to the first in, in our context, both Mbeki and Chabalana and Seman were appealing to the neglected strengths of what they termed the community. Uh, in looking after their own, to the benefits of a rather idealized African culture. Now, unfortunately, in this perverse and rather fatal formulation, blocking access to the best that Western science has to offer in favor of saying that communities must and can look after their own in a culturally appropriate and idealized African way, this could be presented and was presented as a way of redressing global power imbalances and of empowering formerly disenfranchised communities. The same language of community care, apart from the more obvious and pervasive cost-saving arguments, has been used around the SED mini tragedy, tragedy. Famously contrasting the brutality of apartheid with the post-apartheid 
AIDS tragedy. Peter Dirk Ais said, and his title has been used by Catherine Campbell in a, in a book cover, which is on your screen. Um, in the past, we killed people. We South Africans killed people. Now we just let them die. If we contrast the act of eugenics of the Nazi era, era, for example, we can say the same thing about care of people with intellectual disability. In the past, we killed people. Now we just let them die. Though Coralie Trotter and others have argued convincingly that what happened to the SED many victims and survivors was torture, it's not true to say that people died or suffered as a result of an active policy to hurt or to kill them. The abuse happened in the breach rather than in the fulfillment of policy. In some senses, that makes it even more scary, I think. This observation creates or instantiates really difficult ideological profession, I think, for all of us in the side professions. How do we countenance and explain away the neglect, the, the allowing to die of disabled people, whether part of the SEDMNE tragedy or not? And I want to suggest two ways in which we allow people to die or not to live as people every day. These are probably not the only possibilities, but I think they're really important in our context. And the first example that I want to talk about is what's termed responsabilization. And we've already seen how we can make an active argument and can say quite moralistically that families can and must take care of their own, that that's culturally appropriate, that we must, um, uh, that, that people must be um, empowered, to do so, that they have a responsibility to do so, that it's part of their culture to do so. This kind of uh, argument is all over the justifications for the SED mini tragedy. But it was probably most clearly expressed by the Premier of the province with which, which I live, so it's not the province where the tragedy occurred, but our Premier, Helen Zilla, um, had this to say on that most subtle of communication platforms as well as will well be known to anybody in the United States, Twitter. And Zilla said as follows, and I quote on Twitter, it is good that the families of the life SED many victims have received a measure of justice and compensation. I would like an answer to this question. What did they do before these tragic deaths to raise the alarm about their loved ones, starving and living in profound neglect? Now, whatever else these, the myriad problems with this tweet may be, especially coming from a person who has a sister who is deaf and who in other respects has quite a good record on disability issues, Zilla is drawing here on a global discourse very prevalent in the current neoliberal era and important, I think, for those interested in transcultural psychiatry to engage with. This is the discourse of what's been termed responsabilization. Now, even though it's not peer-reviewed, I rather like the Wiktionary definition of the term. And according to this definition, the um, responsabilization is, and I quote, the transfer of responsibility from higher authorities to communities or individuals who are then called on to take an active role in resolving their own problems, unquote. Now, in theory, this sounds very much like empowerment, which disability groups and others commonly fight for. But as many critics have shown, there's a problem here. Recently, Vandana Chowdhury, and her article again will, it will be on the uh, web page, has argued that World Bank policies about responsabilization in relation to disability in India place pressure on people who structurally have little power and, and few resources. Somehow what they have to do is take charge of their lives and take action when in reality they're in no position to do this because they don't have resources and they don't have the personal and social capital to act. So responsabilization as an ideology can amount to a form of victim blaming. A few weeks ago, I was at a meeting at a disability organization about measuring progress of families from poverty and exclusion to a situation we would all like, a situation of not being poor and of being included in society. I commented to the outside facilitator, uh, who was a person who came from a social responsibility business funded by the private sector, 
that I saw a problem with expecting people with no resources to get themselves out of poverty. The facilitator's response was that, that I, Leslie, am patronizing towards poor disabled people because I believe that they cannot do anything. Now, I've got no doubt that she actually heard my comments in this way. But what I was objecting to was that I saw a version in what she was saying of the American dream. Every individual with grit and determination can succeed. Now, to me, this is not a story of, this, of, emp of empowerment, but a denial of the reality of disadvantage. And this is exactly the kind of argument that can be, be made about SED many. The argument that if families cared enough, if they were good enough, if they were African enough, if they respected their culture enough, they would have been able to care for their relatives with, without help. Now, I probably don't have to tell people in this audience what a lie this is and how anguished many, many families are all over the world over their inability to care for their loved ones in the way that they would wish to. And in this regard, I'm going to, to make um, some comparisons. Again, just look at this next slide. And it says an unexpected error occurred. Let's hope that it's, uh, something's happening. Just let me see if I can get the next slide. Um, um, okay, I'm not, for some reason, I'm not able to move the slides on. Um, I'm just going to ask the, the technical person if he can help us. It doesn't matter. Uh, sorry. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Monica, for saving my life. Um, okay, so these are two posters uh, from, these are Nazi posters. And both of them uh, talk about the same thing. They talk about what in the Nazi regime was referred to as useless feeders. And it's particularly obvious on the left where you see the ideal of the healthy Aryan person having to bear the burden of these useless feeders. And these are the, these rather grotesque people with disabilities. And of course, the Nazi argument was um, it cost six Six thousand rice, or sixty thousand rice mark, to feed such a useless eater, for the good and for the health of society in general. Let's um, get rid of these people. It's an uh, it's an act of social and cultural hygiene. Something which, um, in his wonderful book um, on the Nazi doctors, uh, Robert J. Lifton spoke about. Now, just think about that. And let's have a look at what, if I, if I can get onto the next slide. Um, and Monica, could you move to the next slide, please? Sure. There you go. Thank you, Monica. Wow, uh, this is very exciting. Um, so this is, um, I'm quoting here from one of our newspapers. The former Gauteng Health MEC, Kaidani Machlangu, repeatedly claimed that moving mental illness patients from SED many was necessary to save the health department money. In her speech, her budget speech, um, MEC is minister, uh, it's a local minister. Uh, uh, she said that the department aimed to save and generate revenue of 100, million, 100 billion rand, which would be directed to essential services. Cost containment initiatives would include reviewing outsourced services, such as this contract. Explaining her decision, she said that in 2014-15 financial year, the department paid over 300 million to Life SED Many to treat over 2,000, just over 2,000 patients. Um, and, she, and she's quoted as saying, it is important to note that the department cannot afford this. Um, the, the budget allocation, which was um, previously utilized, will be reprioritized um, accordingly. Um, yeah, so this, this, as you can see, there are echoes here in the contemporary democratic uh, 
neoliberal South African context of what we heard um, many years ago when uh, uh, under conditions of uh, um, deliberately killing people with mental disorders. Um, I'm going to try. No, uh, Monica, can we, it's the, the very last slide. I will, sure. No problem. There you go. Okay. So the second thing that I, so I've spoken about responsabilization. The second point that I want to talk about is this issue of concealment. Now, one of the central struggles of the disability movement globally has been and continues to be the struggle to be seen. According to the most recent and most authoritative global report on disability, which is the WHO World Bank report of 2001, approximately 15% of the world's population has a disability. This makes disability the most common category of social exclusion and oppression in the world, with the exception of female gender. Uh, disability is, is, is often linked to poverty, so it's more common in low income countries and middle income countries like my own than it is in richer countries. People are often amazed at the statistic, 15% of the world's population. And it is important to, to acknowledge that the term disability is a very broad blanket portmanteau term for a very wide range of different experiences. It is, for example, very different to be a highly successful male wheelchair rugby player, for example, than to be a woman living in poverty with the consequences of a traumatic closed head brain injury. But both of them are, are counted under the umbrella, umbrella category disability. Despite this caveat, though, whenever I teach students or even talk to a group such as this one, I say to them, either you have a disability or you're close to someone who has one. And it's extremely rare for anybody to disagree. So disability is everywhere, but discursively it's nowhere and a kind of issue of boutique interest. Now, as a feminist disability studies a theorist, Rosemary Garland Thompson says, disability is nowhere until you can see it and then it is everywhere. And I think this fact has consequences. For example, Jason Bunke, my, my colleague, and I recently sent an article for review to a very good uh, psychology journal. It was a community psychology journal. The editor responded saying she really liked the manuscript, but she wasn't going to be sending it for review because we did not reference the community psychology literature, but chose instead to focus on literature from disability studies, which she saw as another field. So we did an analysis of over a thousand articles published in that journal over some years, and we found, not unexpectedly to us, that approximately 3% of the articles in this community psychology journal dealt with disability. Now, if the global rate of disability is 15%, the expected rate of articles on disability in a journal concerned with psychological consequences of social exclusion and oppression would be at the very least 15%. It actually should be more because the journal is focusing specifically on social exclusion and oppression. So there should have been more than five times the number of articles than actually were in the journal. There were plenty of argument, articles on race, on gender, on LGBTIQ issues and on poverty, but almost nothing on disability. So the reason we weren't citing community psychology literature on disability is not that we were ignoring the literature, but it was because the literature wasn't there. So, so there's some really excellent work, make no mistake, in psychology uh, on disability and the tides turning. But in general, it remains true to say that there's very little when measured both against the yardstick of global disability prevalence and against work on other areas of concern in emancipatory community psychology. So we have a situation where disability is everywhere and nowhere where it's simply not prominent in, in people's minds as a core social concern, and where in our disciplines, the side disciplines at least, but I can, as I can show, not only in our discipline, disability is studied and thought about less frequently and less systematically than might be expected. And I don't think this is by chance. It's not by mistake that we're amazed, that we are amazed when we hear how common disability is, or even that mental health problems are or that we don't consider disability a core issue of the work of mainstream side disciplines. 
There is ideological work keeping disability as an issue out of sight and out of mind. There may be many reasons for this, not least of which may well be the very painful point that Valerie Sinison makes frequently. Nobody longs to have a disabled child. And there's an exception here with uh, people in the deaf community want to, wanting to have deaf children. But this community regards deafness as a linguistic and, minority, and cultural minority issue rather than a disability issue. I think there's also something at work here about a rather difficult interpersonal politics of disgust. Even people who are concerned to promote disability rights may feel repulsed by some aspects of bodily difference and differences in functioning and may have difficulty in dealing with disfigurement, incontinence, bad smells and the like. I struggle with my own disgust that I sometimes feel at the sight of non-normative bodies. Now, as I say this to you, I, I feel ashamed. And, and I've got, I considered not saying this because nobody will know what I'm not saying. Uh, uh, the last thing I want to be seen as an, as an activist disability studies scholar, scholar is as someone who's, who's disgusted by some aspects of disability. But if I remove this admission, not only am I complicit in concealing a concern which may, may relate to disability more broadly, I am also complicit in concealing the act of concealment itself. On we go neatly, don't stare at the funny people, look the other way, it's much more polite. As Garland Thompson notes in her wonderfully titled book, and I've, I've got the, the cover there at the bottom right hand corner, staring how we look, staring is in fact part of life. We shouldn't be trying to stop staring. We should be trying to understand what makes us want to stare, what makes us want to look away, the complex um, dance of attraction, fascination, and repulsion. Many people say to me, they don't want to get involved in looking at or studying disability because they fear offending disabled people. They fear retaliation from disabled people. Now, it's certainly true that disability activists since the 1970s in particular have made it clear that they don't wish to be the objects of the gaze of others poured over, spoken for, and spoken about. Um, they uh, they um, uh, want to be represented in ways which um, give them dignity. But there are also many dangers in not, re not representing people. Um, at the heart of contemporary disability studies is an insistence on the right of disabled people to participate in life on an equal basis with others, and that requires people not to be hidden. Now, I could talk a lot more about how we see this as, as ways of protecting people um, and the way that we ex exclude people, but um, I want to come back at the end here to the question of the tragedy. 144 people died in this tragedy. These people are speaking forcefully to us. They're speaking to my country, to the world, to, about abuse, about the shame and scandal of what human beings can do to one another in the name of culture, community care, and cost saving. They're articulate, or they're being made to be articulate. But I've, what I've been trying to ask about is what about their voices before they died? Um, what is our role, not just when tragedy has st struck um, in an obvious way, but what is our role in preventing tragedies from happening, from uh, confronting these and intervening in the epidemies that are happening every day? And I hope I've given some sense in this talk of some of the responsibility that we, that we bear and our own complicity in this. Thank you. I'm going to hand back to... Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for a provocative and compelling presentation. In the few minutes we have left, I will ask you some of the questions that we have received from the audience. We've got, got great questions, but unfortunately we will not be able to go through all of them, so I'll just pick a few. Um, and I'll pass the floor to you after I formulate each question, and you can keep the responses concise. That will allow us to go through a few more questions. So let me ask the first one. How much do you feel stigma on African cultural beliefs, such as believing mental illness is due to witchcraft, impacts on disabilities being hidden? 
Uh, thank you. That's an, uh, an excellent question. I, I don't think there's much, much question that um, local beliefs uh, within Africa do uh, at times contribute to, to people being hidden away and people being stigmatized. I think it's also the case that um, some cultural beliefs, and I mean, there's some evidence in favor of this in the mental health literature, actually enable communities to be more um, accepting of people with, with uh, mental disorders and, and disabilities. I'm reminded of a, an American anthropologist who works in South Africa who says, culture is what makes us human and it's also what makes us inhuman. So I think in any context, local cultural beliefs have to be borne in mind. But I think what we tend to think about less are the way in which uh, professional cultures also play a role in these aspects of, of uh, stigmatization. So I would absolutely agree that local beliefs are important to think about. But these more global discourses, I think, are, are also cultural and also important to think about. Thanks, Monica. Great. Thank you, Leslie. How can we expose and challenge carelessness? In the UK, unexpected deaths of people with learning disabilities have been systematically ignored. Yes, I, I, I mean, I, I, I uh, didn't talk about the Justice for LB campaign, which is obviously a campaign which if you're in Britain, you, you know about. I, I, I mean, I can't tell other people how to do this, but, but this, it, we have a responsibility. This is part of our, the, the ongoing struggle and part of my worry um, about mental health practitioners. And one of the things I didn't get to talk to, talk to was the, the recent, you'll, you'll see in the last slide, I, um, I mentioned the uh, Bandy Lee book on the dangerous case of Donald Trump. And part of the dilemma uh, which these psychologists and psychiatrists in the States have mentioned is that um, we are socialized as health professionals often to be quiet and not to think about our public role. And we have, if we're serious about prevention of mental disorder, we know that it's about social inequality, we know all of these things. Um, prevention of debts and so on. It is our job to get out there and, and just keep, to, to keep talking and to, to keep being activists. And this is often against, I think for me, as a, as a more introverted type of mental health person, it's often against our, our professional culture. But um, all strength to you in the, in the United Kingdom who are doing this, we, we just have to keep doing this. And partly that's why I'm talking about these sorts of things in this talk. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, Leslie. You talked about multi-dimensions of fear in clinicians and researchers towards disabled people. What is this fear? How does it get structurally constructed and how can this fear be tackled? Could we say that this is a kind of a stigma or something else? Wow, <laughs> uh, these questions are too good for me. Um, so I'm not going to be able to answer your, your question properly. I think you know, one of the issues about um, disability is that we are all, as the disability movement likes to say, we're all temporarily abled. So I know that unless I do something very active, it, it, it can be done. I'm not going to be a woman tomorrow. I'm not going to turn into a black person. Um, I, I'm, in some senses, there, there are many excluded and oppressed identities which are not available to me. But I may become disabled today, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm getting older, I'm, you know, I'm having hearing problems that I didn't have before. So, you know, there's increasing rates of impairment as we get older. So I do think that part of what everybody, and this is not just uh, uh, professionals, uh, everybody fears their own disablement. And partly for this reason, um, but not solely, um, people with disabilities become what Tom Shakespeare, the uh, British sociologist and disability studies scholar calls dustbins for disavowal. I think one of the, the ways in which we think about disability is that we can put into, and for those of you who are psychoanalytically inclined, but I might use the term projective identification, we put into other people our own fears, which are fears that we all have of being damaged, of being dirty, of being not good enough, not clever enough, of not being sane enough, and so on. 
And I think that part of what is required here in the training of, of mental health professionals and in the practice of mental health professionals is some acknowledgement of this and some acknowledgement that the very structure of how we construct our professions is designed to protect us all from fears which are very human and we all have. And just because we're at the interface, it doesn't mean that we have them less than other people. In fact, we might have them more. Thanks, Monica. Okay, I'll ask you what might be the last question, unfortunately, but you've candidly reflected on your experience as a student with that one week immersion in an institutional setting and the challenges and opportunities that it entailed. How should students or residents get initiated and trained in this field, particularly in light of the political nature of this work that you have so eloquently described? And I'll just add on, uh, probably linking to another question we've received, uh, with a focus particularly in low and middle income countries uh, and improving mental health care in those countries. I mean, that's a, that's a, a really uh, excellent question. I mean, what we try to do and what I think should be done is um, there have to be more opportunities for meaningful participation outside of an institutional context. Um, much more recognition. I mean, this is starting to be recognized that, that um, uh, there are different kinds of expertise. So professionals certainly have expertise, but people who understand what it's like to live with disability, including intellectual disability or mental disorder, which we call psychosocial disability on a day-to-day -day basis, are people who have those disabilities themselves. Um, what I try and do with my students is um, place them in situations where um, they're working on an, on an equal basis with, with the people with um, psychosocial disabilities as far as possible. Um, I also think like in, in, in uh, the field of psychosocial disability and mental disorders, um, it's very helpful to get people who, who disrupt stereotypes. So, so people who have strengths in other areas um, to talk with people. Other ways of engagement are also very helpful. I'm, I'm very mindful of the fact that in Betsy DeVos uh, in the United States yesterday withdrew state funding for Special Olympics. Now, Special Olympics, which is, you know, increases participation in sport for people, largely people with intellectual disability, autism as well, is an amazing opportunity for people to, and our students, um, to get a sense of, of what, what people can do, um, not just what they can't do. Um, and I think that in some senses, in low and middle income countries, because they're often fewer opportunities for institutionalization, fewer opportunities for spending a lot of money on keeping people apart. There's, there's often more opportunity, in fact, for um, social interaction and, and that we should capitalize on that. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, Leslie. I think we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, thank you very much for, for that presentation. Um, a brief evaluation will be sent to the email address. Let me, I think we have um, the link here. Exactly, yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll send you a, a brief evaluation to the email address that you used to register with us, or you can use, just copy and paste the URL that appears in this final slide. It will take less than five minutes to complete and it really helps us to plan future webinars. Um, also, the recording of this webinar in English, in French, and in Spanish will soon be posted on the websites of the, of the McGill Global Mental Health Program and the other webinar series sponsors whose logos you can see at the bottom of the slide. Thank you again, Leslie, for an excellent presentation. Thank you to all of you for your participation. I know some of you um, got up early, others are going to bed late um, around the world. Um, I wish you a good rest of your day or good night. And I hope you will join us again next May as our webinar series continues. Thank you very much and I'll take care.